You're listening to the Autism Weekly Podcast. Each week, we share community voices and bring light to stories that increased awareness, acceptance, equity, access, and inclusion across the autism community. If you haven't already, subscribe to join the Autism Weekly family. I'm your host, Jeff Skibitsky, and I'm excited to welcome Ron Oberleitner to the podcast to talk about the role of telehealth in autism care. Ron is the founder and CEO of an organization called Behavior Imaging Solutions and is and always has been passionate about developing technologies to increase access to healthcare and improve behavioral health. When it comes to the future of autism services, we have a lot to talk about. Ron, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jeff. Great to be here. So, Ron, I always start just by getting a glimpse into the lives and the passions of our guests because uh, autism is such a passion-driven field. And I know that you and your family have been intimately involved with so much, um, both on the autism side, but also on the tech side of healthcare for such a long time. Can you give us a little bit of a background about what brought you this direction? Sure, Jeff. Yes. Uh, It's probably no surprise to many that I do have a personal connection to autism. 28 years ago, we saw our youngest son as a one-year-old start to lose his ability to speak, respond to his mom and I, until he seemingly was in his own world. And at the same time, he was having recurring pain and discomfort that many families can relate to who have children like uh, our son. And it took us more than 18 months and six different doctors at traveling more than a thousand miles uh, to be able to finally find out that what this strange thing was, was autism. And actually it was a different diagnosis, but it eventually was your classic autism. And even though I was a medical technology executive at the time and had access to doctors and friends and all that sort of thing. So with that uh, day job of mine, uh, when we finally got the diagnosis, I started making comparisons in my own mind of where I developed technology for surgeons who treat kids with facial deformities. And even back then, those doctors were using things like Skype, the video conferencing of its day, to be able to interact with families, save them a visit to the doctor's office. And even families would send pictures of their kids' deformity, uh, their cleft lips prior to surgery. And the doctors were able to say, well, I'm not the right surgeon for that, but maybe somebody else is. Uh, At the same time, we knew that video clips of my son's behaviors were going to help him get health care. And we wanted to provide that data to a doctor that could help us. And we finally led to a part of studying where that could help him ac- uh, access healthcare, and we developed a company around it, Behavior Imaging Solutions. And and it's those stories. It's that personal connection. It's the ability to take your somebody's skill set and take it with their passion that I think creates such wonderful innovation in our field. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of the community that still is not completely aware of everything that uh, a family might struggle with um, when they're trying to find all the services or trying to understand the perspective of their child who might think differently. What is it as we celebrate Autism Awareness Month right now that you'd be telling families through your learning process is so valuable to reflect on? Hmm. One thing that took me way too long to f- discover myself is the, really the, the spectrum uh, that autism presents itself in our community. I've received millions of dollars of, of grant money to study how telehealth could happen. And I naively thought everybody's autism was like our families. Uh, the child cannot speak and um, having you know issues uh, sleeping at night and all those things. And It only has been maybe 15 years into this advocacy work that I realize autism is different things even to the autism community. Robbie has something called profound autism, uh, but there is equally autism for higher functioning kids. Each of them have their own challenges, but every one of those kids has gifts and talents that hopefully can be surfaced through 
professionals, family support. And that's what I want everybody to know who doesn't is not aware of that. It, it sounds as if you're truly encompassing that uh, idea of celebrate and you're celebrating the individual, you're celebrating the person. Um, Right now, we're at a time where there's so many people not getting access to care. I just recently, it was this morning, actually, I was reading on CNN is that because of COVID is that we ran into a diagnostic um, shortfall. We don't have enough diagnosticians. They're not able to put a lot of people through treatment and then treatment shortfall because we were in, in able or unable, sorry, to access so many providers. And our providers started to shrink during that time period because the service delivery business, which we are providing a very important service of direct integration with uh, clinical care into the community, was one that you saw a lot of the degradation of, of employee base is that it started to shrink. Um, with technologies like behavior imaging is that that should be an opening to access to care. So give us a background of what behavior imaging actually does that allows access to care. Yes, it uses the power of telehealth. These are technologies either to connect a doctor and a patient via video conference or other kinds of asynchronous telehealth tools like capturing a video or capturing an x-ray and sharing it remotely with the doctor, um, as well as filling out questionnaires and sending in that kind of data, all in the uh, goal of being able to access care uh, regardless of distance and always to connect with a more um, expert clinician who knows that condition is what telehealth allows us to do, regardless where that can, clinician may lead. Um, this from the late 90s has been something that made just perfect sense to us. As I explained earlier, my day job was doing this for the surgical community. But for autism, for some reason, the community was used to what was very predominantly a mental health model. And that is a patient comes in to see a clinician who, if there's enough time and dialogue and, and, um, and analysis, that patient could be helped. The challenge with autism is that even once diagnosis is made, ongoing care is in the hours per week regimen for the child to be able to make improvements. Such important behavior therapy treatments need time and recurring visits. It is unsustainable to do it always in person. Telehealth bridges that interaction, that progress, even when there is no in-person visits. And it's it's uh, crucial for a chronic condition like autism to be able to have that increased access that telehealth provides. And I'm just looking through the idea of what a patient visit feels like for a family, especially as you explained your situation is that Robbie had profound autism. I would imagine that there are times going into the community was a little bit of a struggle for a doctor's appointment or for a diagnostic eval. The ease of access to be able to get video footage directly to a clinician of these important behaviors or the interactions or the social engagements of your child in their natural environment, that sounds like that sounds like a game changer. It sounds like something that you cannot necessarily get in a 30 minute clinical visit, but by utilizing and leveraging technology, you really start to see the whole child and you see their environment. What is the feedback you're getting from clinicians on the use of this tool? Does it, does it actually make the diagnostic process sometimes more valuable? It, it does. Um, early on, we saw the promise when, after we got our first grant to study uh, use of a video camera to capture uh, behaviors, we were able to show clinicians on the East Coast what some of the naturalistic video would look like for a family trying to show atypical symptoms. And actually, the clinician's jaw dropped. It was it was contextual. It was something that their clinical experience was able to relate to what they see in the clinic typically, but to see it on a stretch of video provided in a, in a 
aspect of time, uh, showed them that parents could follow their instructions to be able to send and share video data that can help their healthcare, um, be it diagnosis or treatment. One, one of the aha moments we also had early on was we, because of my son's recurring struggles, went to see a neurologist um, at a center of excellence. And we were trying to describe, my wife would describe, you know, the last couple of weeks in one way, I would describe it in another way. I would think she was describing it wrongly. And she would think I wasn't saying enough of the urgency. And so the clinician had to really take all this secondary input and make some sort of uh, uh, recommendation going forward. And, and the recommendation was, uh, let's keep monitoring the symptoms, look out for these sort of things and come back in six weeks. And almost dejected, like we were going to go back to being on our own and our son will be in distress for another six weeks. We took out a video and showed some of the self-injurious uh, behavior that uh, he had been doing that we tried to describe earlier. But just seeing the video of that behavior told the doctor something different right away. Uh, response to intervention was uh, much more um, uh, helpful to support us as we left that visit. And then that doctor encouraged us to send video images to see if Robbie was getting better over the time. A great relief for us to say we had access to clinicians even after this office visit was done. Um, so I think the doctor appreciated and our family felt so supported that we were going in the right direction and had the right care professional there to support us. Yeah, I, I never actually thought about the continuity of care piece and having that immediate access and almost like the ability to engage right then and continue engagement. That's got to feel better for a parent that they're not sent off on their own. And I, I like the way that you put that. It's it's an important, powerful piece that you're not just given some info and told to get out. <laughs> you're actually walked through the process, white gloved, as you should, as a recipient of care. Um, it's it's very interesting. Um, and you touched on the access to care piece. And maybe that's something that I'd love to, to get a little bit more insight from you. Um, I was at a, a webinar where I was listening to some of the leaders in the psych field and the developmental pediatric field talk about the access to care being one of the biggest problems right now with the whole treatment model is that we have uh, the, the pig in the python right now is getting people in for diagnostics. There's long wait lists. It's a lengthy process. And yet there's a way to do it more efficiently for a large subset of the population with the same accuracy in diagnostic um, uh, assessment. So how is it, and I guess what does behavior imaging do to help to make it so that clinicians can be more efficient through the process so that they don't exacerbate these wait periods where people are missing out on crucial care? Great question, Jeff. Um, and we've studied this prospectively as well, just to, uh, put the context in, let's talk about the diagnostic assessment process that you referred to. The, the current standard of care, if, if you can call it that, is uh, one in, in about 40 families will learn from either the primary care doc or maybe a teacher who kind of had an experience or some other person who uh, is in a referral kind of role that this family would best serve their child to go get an autism evaluation at one of the diagnostic clinics that are specialized in doing so. Um, it takes a while for a family to digest that and understand like why is not my primary care doctor doing that, but they are coached to understand there are specialists that need to do this. Um, if you have enough resources and payment uh, ability, you can maybe move up the the waiting list and get to uh, meet with one of these specialists in the month's time, coordinate your schedule where you can bring your child, hopefully they're well-behaved that day enough to get in the door and that uh, they'd be able to be seen. If you don't have financial resources, you invariably will be waiting six months to a year on a waiting list, sometimes 18 months and more to get into one of these diagnostic clinics. And it's not just a one-shot deal as well. The child comes, they are assessed in person, and 
maybe after several visits at certain times, uh, the clinicians who are specialists in this area can make a diagnosis of autism. Extremely important for that child to be able to have some resource justification to get treatment afterwards. Things like ABA therapy, other kinds of uh, treatments are, are possible. Uh, without that, families are on their own pretty much. Um, so what does behavior imaging do differently? It puts the uh, waiting list on the background. It invites a family through an app that they download um, and they register and they put the org code of the clinic that they'll be interacting there so they can start a relationship with the specialty clinic. Well, the app guides them to say, this is what your clinician is going to require to be able to start doing the assessment. Usually it's some video samples of behavior in the room, in the house, uh, as well as a developmental questionnaire. Um, that's on the family. If family's motivated, they feel like they need answers sooner or later, they will be able to provide that information. And 96% of the time, they are providing clinically relevant information for diagnostic clinicians to make a diagnostic assessment. The app and the clinician suite of tools they use that we develop at NOTA also provides interactive texting so clinicians can ask for additional information. And more recently, a combination of a video conference utility that the clinicians can even do diagnostic histories. So those steps are send the videos in that you collect in your home, get on a video conference with the clinician, um, potentially send in more videos to be able to uh, 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 justify uh, uh, an assessment opinion. And at the end of that process, a, a clinician is um, able confidently to make a diagnostic opinion. Is it autism or not? And in some cases, are there comorbidity, more comorbidities that have been recognized? In our research, it is half the time of doing the in-person if you do a construct. Most of the time is uh, wasted or, or spent for families to just put the information together. So if they are motivated, they can get an assessment in a fraction of the time as an in-person. The clinician's time is also uh, preserved. Instead of having a lot of uh, brick and mortar uh, administrative time uh, kind of wasted and not doing clinical, they can get right to the clinical assessment in telehealth and spend a fraction of the clinical time doing the work that they're experts in to make a diagnostic uh, opinion. So software supports the telehealth workflow and telehealth helps do this remotely instead of coming into a clinic. Yeah, and you hear families all the time and they say is that, you know, I, I don't want to wait, I'll do whatever I have to, to be able to get in the door. It sounds like the way that you've set it up is that you've empowered them. You've given them the option to, you know, expedite the process by being able to get the information by uploading the videos and their time frame. I think that that is something that most families would truly appreciate. I'm sure you get that feedback. I mean, for the family experience right now, what are they what are they saying? Are they are they saying that it's a, it's something that wow, this takes a weight off my shoulder or I, I mean, what is their feedback at the moment? Mostly it's um, it's positive that they've gone through this step. It's hard to really expect wonderful feedback from these families who go through the diagnostic process because they don't know what to compare it to. You know, like they, they don't know what an in-person assessment is like and what it struggles. But positively to get an answer for themselves has been the real positive um, uh, impact that a telehealth service like uh, NOTA is the name of this, is been able to get them for diagnostic assessments. Um, and then we've also studied, does that NOTA report help them access treatment? And it has the same impact as going to a clinic after a year's wait, getting a diagnostic report finally handed to you to get access to the treatment services you need, but again, in a fraction of the time. And it, it's heartening to families and they have really positive impact or feedback about that. There's but, also the, know, hid, the hidden impact, yeah. the, the feedback that might, you might not be getting, but from the clinical world, 
obviously is that the research would be showing me is that you take a child who was supposed to be getting service six months ago and they're still waiting versus getting them through the process is that the prognosis for treatment already is at a higher trajectory and the ability for the family to fully engage in everything their child wants to do and to open up the world to them it starts the path soon which as a parent, that's all I care about. So I can see the other end of that being so valuable too, is that clinical outcomes must improve through this access to care model. Very much so. But you know, we've been on this path and have seen the receptive parents, the receptive teachers that would use similar types of tools to be able to say, I need my students to be seen by a specialist in their classroom. We've had them also just believing this because I've been one of those parents that said, every day I have to wait with my very troubled, discomforted child and not get him help that I can't fix and, and do myself is a day that I'm just feeling terrible about his future prospects and and my own ability as a parent. Telehealth can help get somebody actively moving in the right direction to do that. What I like about telehealth, because I've had so many visits too with well-meaning but untrained medical doctors more than often than not, that just really can't do much because they don't have the clinical training about autism until fairly recently. I'd rather see a telehealth doc who understands autism, who knows that my son having maybe, you know, something putting in his throat for a sore throat is not really so necessary at the moment because the behaviors is something I need clinical guidance immediately for. Um, so the, you know, the autism trained medical doctors can be better accessed through telehealth than, than through, um, you know, just going to your local doc and expecting them to have the clinical uh, experience. That's, that's an excellent point. I, you look at most medical specialties is that they're specialists and you have access to them. The first fields to move towards telemedicine, of course, were the specialists to be able to increase access and to grow uh, a, a more of an opportunity to be able to utilize a network better. Um, so I, I definitely see that and I'd echo that sentiment. Are there patients that you'd say, this isn't the right sort of patient for this model of care, or do, is it a, or is it a, a model that's flexible that, you know, you should be able to grasp everybody through this process? You know, it's still early in the days to say, what are we what kind of patients does this work best for? And the challenge is also that we are comparing what is the right result to those who have been seen in person and have had either diagnosis done or uh, a, a behavior assessment that says this is the cause of the behavior. That is the gold standard telehealth compares to. So Telehealth at this point, and the NOTA has some really good research behind it, says for about 85% of the at-risk kids that are going to be assessed, it works in less time with equal fidelity than that. There's about 15% that uh, probably need to come in and have different kinds of interactions with diagnostic professionals to be able to sort out their their um, their behaviors in a way that is diagnostically appropriately appropriate. But conversely, what the clinicians who are using NOTA also say, those clini those families that have come in for in-person assessments, which is of course of just a, a period of time where the child might be doing what they tend to do as an autistic uh, child or not, um, uh, also can leave that in-person visit with questions in the clinician's mind to say, I don't know if I've seen enough of the behaviors. And now the clinicians are starting to recommend NOTA for those families who go home. So a typical behavior samples can be shared back to give clinicians more confidence if a diagnosis is warranted or not. Do you it's see funny they, when you see that. When you see yeah. that, the variety that can come out of one product, it's like, you know, Initially, is that might have been this way, and maybe maybe you'd already thought through all this, but to see another use of the product in a way that's so valuable, that's got to be exciting to be able to build off of. 
So when yeah. you think of the future of autism care and you're thinking of, I mean, the, this choke point of being able to get people to access to treatment being so important, where do you think? Where do you think telehealth is going to move? I mean, if you were to to look and, and make guesses, is this going to open up to the insurance world? Are regulators going to be more and more excited about it? Um, I think that you all went through some processes to get into uh, the market. Uh, what do you see coming forward out of this? Yeah. So what has been seen even before COVID is that um, – Conditions like autism are a collaborative care uh, uh, issue, meaning multiple specialties can really make a best impact on a child's uh, care, be it their behavior specialist, their medical needs, their speech therapy. Collaborative care is the way to go. Telehealth can enable that collaborative care. It can help the primary care doc get uh, a second opinion or guidance from the behavior specialist through this telehealth um, uh, environment at a fraction of the interaction and the cost to get these professionals impacting the care. So I believe telehealth is going to help make a collaborative care model for our autistic kids viable. I think the regulators are starting to see that you need the professionals making diagnoses and behavior specialists and psychiatrists making maybe some of those um, sort of assessments along the way. And when they see what telehealth does as far as being able to save um, the patient information that really warrants the medical need in a health record that our telehealth systems can provide for them, it is going to be uh, even more accepted. And it already through COVID has been widely accepted as a way of, of providing access. And they're finding that the clinical care is not suffering in any way. So in the future, I'm thinking the regulators are going to adapt it begrudgingly because it costs money in their mind to say, we're going to make these transactions. But they're going to see the access to better professionals being giving right care and less care, less, you know, more bad care is not better care for a child. So better care through telehealth connections with professionals are going to save regulators, uh, insurance companies uh, uh, money in the future while keeping a good record of what's working for our kids. So I'm very bullish on it. And I think we're going to be able to use the experience through COVID to say, um, people are still getting evaluated as good, if not better, with these tools, and they're actually getting better treatment as a result of reaching their better specialists like your company provides um, via telehealth than, than always waiting for an in-person meeting to occur. Yeah. And Ron, I, I can honestly say, I think I'm on that train with you. <laughs> so, but what I, what I'd like to be able to do is give families the opportunity, especially those who have been sitting for such a long time to know where to go find these resources to know, you know, how can I access behavior imaging NOTA? How do I know where clinicians are that have um, utilized this technology so I can get my child into care? But then also clinicians need that information so they can incorporate it into practice. So where do they get all of all of this wonderful info? <laughs> Thanks. Well, first with a, a disclaimer that when they come to our website, behavioramaging.com, they'll see some of these technology-based solutions, but they should be uh, aware that we set them up to be understood mostly by the clinicians the families are going to interact with. In my mind, it doesn't help families to know these tools work when their clinicians aren't on the back end uh, healthily receiving those. So um, just to appreciate that. And, and what they'll get a perspective is this is not just for the diagnosis and maybe the early days of treatment. This is helping the teenagers who are depressed, uh, who also need help the adults who um, are out there on their own and need access to counseling or, uh, you know, uh, healthcare and really can't communicate that. So you'll see a, a wider array and, and it, it goes outside of autism that we've started to uh, support as well, because this type of tool just makes sense for a lot of different behavior conditions. If they want to see the specific research we're talking about that we're 
doing that uses video conference, go to autismresearch.org and it will be an invitation for clinicians that maybe the families already work with to be even be part of this current um, NIH research study we're doing for increased access to diagnosis. And I, I do encourage the same thing. I think that information is power. And I think change is hard and for clinicians to feel comfortable and for families to know that, yeah, you know what, this is not only going to give me equal access to care, but it's going to make it more equitable in time, which, you know, is what families are looking for, is that it's a wonderful model. So I appreciate all that you've done so far. I look forward to seeing where you're going with this, Ron. And uh, and thanks for coming on and, and chatting with us today. Jeff, thank you for communicating to your audience the potential for these kind of tools to, to increase access. Thank you for listening to Autism Weekly. We hope you tune back in next week to learn more about autism in the real world. Autism Weekly is now found on all the major listening apps, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. Subscribe to be notified when we post a new podcast. Autism Weekly is produced by ABS Kids. ABS Kids is proud to provide diagnostic assessments and ABA therapy to children with developmental delays like autism spectrum disorder. You can learn more about ABS Kids and the Autism Weekly podcast by visiting abskids.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you again next week. Thank you.